See, today, hell, not a lot of people talk about hell. They like to avoid hell because that's uncomfortable. If I talk about hell, people might not come to church and then they won't give. I'm just being honest with you, all right? And see, what we do is we make people comfortable with hell. And here's what's going to happen. See, this is just for just the other day I saw. And what happens is you're going to be shocked after you die. If you think that there is no hell, that there is no torment, there is no, there is no suffering. Sitting in the parking lot, I think it was Target, and there's a, car, there's a car right here. That car has been there for at least 30 minutes probably. And this person comes out of Target, and they are on, how many of y'all this is what people do when they come out of stores? Walking through a parking lot with moving vehicles, all this stuff going on, and this is what they're doing while they're walking. And this person walked, and they walked right into the car. And then they're like, and like they're cussing the car out. And, and it's like, where'd you come from? I was, because they're completely lost in the moment. See, the world for you today is the moment. And we got to be prepared for what's ahead. Heaven or hell's ahead. There was a, there was a um, <laughs> I wish, because this, this little illustration hit me this morning. And, um, but I remember when a lady, I met some of y'all remember this, it was caught on a security camera at a mall, and she was walking with her phone, okay? She's walking with her phone through the mall, and she tripped and went right into the fountain. There was a big water fountain in the middle of the mall. How many of y'all remember that? Anybody? And, and she tried to sue the mall. It didn't work very well for her. And, and so then she did a, um, a personal safety announcement for people not to read text and walk. It was not safe. And, uh, but that's it. People just get so caught up in the world, so lost in the world. There's a story about a, um, uh, a young man walking by a, a grave. And he sees this epitaph. Go ahead and show that next picture. And it says on the uh, tombstone, Consider, young man, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare, young man, to follow me. This is a smart young man. And he read that. And he thought for a minute. And he got out a, a knife. And he scribbled. And wrote on the tombstone, show the next one. He put, to follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. <laughs> um, if you're going to follow somebody, you better make sure they're leading the right way. Yeah, make sure they're leading the right way. Jesus had three years. Three years of ministry that we have recorded where he spoke, he preached, he taught. During those three years, um, did you know that he preached on hell 33 times? There's 36 months in three years. That means he almost preached on hell every single month. He told people about hell. Can you imagine if you as a pastor and that's what you're preaching on every single, well, once a month, I got to tell you all, all about hell and you're going to burn. I mean, you're not going to have a whole lot of people lining up, I'm not sure. But Jesus did it, so I think it's a pretty good example. He wasn't afraid to talk about it. Why did Jesus talk about hell so much? If it's just a place where you're not going to be tormented, it's just... It's only there to burn away the sins of the universe. I got news for you. When he died on the cross, his blood washed away your sins. Hell, he's trying to save you... He, why die on the cross if hell is not a place where you can be tormented? Jesus preached on hell at least once a month. Why? He did it because he doesn't want you to go to hell. He did it because he loves you so much. He doesn't want you to go to hell. I'm talking about hell today. Because I don't want you to go to hell. And more, I know I'm talking to a room mainly of believers. 
I, we, we should be. But I want you to leave here with a fire and a compassion to snatch people, to understand the people that we lifted up. We yelled out names. We spoke names today. Those people are going to hell. Snatch them. Lord, I don't want them. I'm going to do everything I can to protect them. I'm going to do everything I can to save them. Even if they don't like me for a while, once they get saved, they'll start to like me again. How many of you have ever had someone, maybe in your life, you had someone that kind of pestered you about Jesus and bothered you about Jesus? Finally, they just got on your nerves so much, but finally... Once you accepted Jesus, you had a new appreciation for that person. I want you to leave here today soul winners. I want you to leave here today people who are saving and snatching people out of hell. Because hell is real. Hell is real. The Bible The Bible talks about hell 167 different times, yet many churches omit it from their teachings. In a recent survey, 35% of Baptists, 54% of Presbyterians, 58% of Methodists, and 60% of Episcopalians do not believe in a literal, literal biblical hell. I saw a survey by, um, by Barna. Barna is, he does a lot of church surveys, very well known. Barna had a survey, uh, it was just a couple years ago, on Christians, people who claim to be Christian. 51% who claim to be Christian in America do not believe in Satan and do not believe in hell. How can you be a Christian? Well, I guess you could be a Christian according to the world's terms of a Christian. How can you be a follower of Christ and not believe or believe that Satan doesn't exist, and there is no hell. We have a problem, people. We have a problem. We, uh, it's called biblical illiteracy. We just like to believe what everyone tells us, and we don't actually look for ourselves in the Bible and read it. Y'all are getting really quiet. Am I stepping on toes today? I mean, y'all are really quiet. Y'all are all like, some of y'all are putting your heads down. Um... That was a big focus when we were at general council last week, was biblical illiteracy. We've got to stop it. It's happening in our churches, and we've got to stop it. Biblical illiteracy. Well, so-and-so says this. If you watch that video that I showed you at the beginning, it looks very professional. It shows all kinds of scriptures. The one scripture didn't talk about, it didn't talk about the gnashing of teeth. That one always bothers me, because that just makes me not, definitely don't want to be in hell. I hate Mouths around me anyway. So, I mean, the gnashing of teeth. Doesn't talk about any of that stuff. It just kind of just skirts over those things. And it makes it sound really good. And if you watch that video, oh, well, well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm thinking this wrong. And that's the start. That's the seed. See, there's a seed for, for salvation. There's a seed planted for you to get the truth, but there's also seeds planted in you to pull you away from God. So, as I look at this, a- another thing, the, here's another disturbing, the, probably the most disturbing one to me. 71% of students, 71% of students in the eight leading seminaries preparing for ministry in the United States do not believe in the literal hell or heaven. Seminaries, Fuller, Duke, Yale, Boston University, Notre Dame, Princeton, Vanderbilt, and Liberty. You think, oh Lord, how Liberty? Liberty has about 15,000 kids on campus, but they have 100,000 students. They're the largest online campus in America, in the world. How many people are taking classes there, studying to be preachers and don't believe in heaven or hell? That's a problem. 71%? Where are we headed in America? We need to understand that hell is real. I've heard this question uh, so many times. Um, How could a loving God send anyone to hell? 
How could a loving God send anyone to hell? That's easy. He doesn't. You do. You send yourself. He's made every way possible for you to escape hell. But it's your choice. He does not want to send you to hell. Matter of fact, he didn't even create hell for you. He doesn't want to send you to hell. Francis Chan wrote a book entitled Erasing Hell. And the whole book is about how uh, America had today. We are erasing hell from our talks, from our churches, from all the subjects. Because we don't want to talk about it. A lot of people just said, you know, as a kid, I'd go to church and hear that sermon, you know, at the end. You could leave here today and be in a car wreck. You don't want to go to hell. And all we talked about was hell and scared people. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. How stupid is that? Can I say that? Just stupid? There is such a thing as having a healthy fear. How many of y'all know that? It was good for my girls to have a healthy fear when they were young. It's good as they're teenagers to have a healthy fear of mom and dad. I think they have a healthier fear of mom than me, to tell you the truth. Y'all think she's all sweet. You ain't seen her with her girls. Is a healthy, come on people, is a healthy fear healthy? Is it needed? Hey, don't touch the top of the oven, it will burn you. Have a fear of that. No, we don't want to teach our kid no. Our child cannot hear the word no because that's a negative in their life. Kids walk around their hand all wrapped up all the time because they keep touching stuff. <laughs> what is it? That should be a healthy fear. Don't do that because there is going to be a consequence. Hell is a consequence of your sin. Hell is a consequence of you saying, no, Jesus. I don't want to accept salvation. No, Jesus. I don't want you to forgive me of my sins. I'm having too much fun right now. I'm too lost in my world to take time for you. Second Peter three nine. Second Peter three nine says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering. It means he's patient. He's not slack. He's not just wasting time. He's not just lazy. But he is patient toward us. And what was his promise? He's not. He's not slack concerning his promise. What is his promise? His promise is he's going to return. And take you home. And he says, I, this scripture tells me, I want to do this. But I'm waiting because there's two more that could accept me. There, there's, there's three more tribes in Africa that need to know who I am and have a chance to accept me. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just waiting a little bit longer for some more. Do you understand what that scripture is saying? And it says this. It says, but long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you don't come to repentance, what are you going to do? Perish. That all should come to repentance. And the beautiful thing is, now you are in the New Testament. And the New Testament where it says, New Testament, we have the law in the Old Testament. And Jesus came and they said, what are you? And he said, there's two things. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. If you do those two things, all the Ten Commandments will come into place. Right? And he says this. It is his loving kindness that will turn you to repentance. It's not his love that he won't let you burn in the lake of fire. It's his love that will turn you to repentance. Not just solely out of fear, but because you realize how good God is and how much He really cares about you. So, let's look today. I want to look at a, a story today. And um, 
The story I want to look at, it's found in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31. Many of you guys, you're familiar with this probably, many of you. Some people call this, this is a story about the rich man and Lazarus. Many refer to it as a parable. Um, I'm kind of on the side with, with some who believe that this isn't so much of a parable, but this is a story that Jesus knows and he's telling. Here's the reason I believe that, because out of, th- how many parables are there? 38 parables. Out of 38 parables, Jesus never gives anybody a name. What you think about this? You got the good Samaritan. You got the prodigal son. But nobody has a name in any parable. But this one, you've got Lazarus. You've got Father Abraham, who they see. The rich man's never named. I believe that's probably because he was probably well known, and Jesus did not want to embarrass that family. But it's a story that Jesus sees. It's, it's reality. That's just my thought on it. Don't, you, don't take that to the bank. You can study it on your own. But why is it that it's the only parable he gives names? So we're going to look at this today. We're going to read it, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to break it down. So let's go to my next scripture. It says, Jesus said, there was a certain rich man. That's kind of given some distinction right there. There's a certain rich man. Who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and who lived each day in luxury, At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Starting to feel for Lazarus a little bit. It's like somebody go put some Neosporin on that man and help him something. Go to the next one. Finally, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and his soul went to the place of the dead. They're in torment. These are Jesus' words. So you can trust the video that some guy put together with a nice English accent. That always makes it sound better, too. If there's a British accent, it just sounds more truthful and just kind of, you know, right? So the rich man also died and was buried. His soul was sent to a place of the dead. They're in torment. That's Jesus' words. He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. He saw him at a far distance. Go to the next slide. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham. I want you to remember that, Father Abraham, because we're going to come back. It tells us who this guy is a little bit. Have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. He's in flames and he's alive. Everybody catch that? He's in flames and he's alive and he still thinks he has power like he was on the world. I'm rich. Get Get him to bring me something. When you wouldn't even give him anything while he was at your doorstep. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. Now, real quick, this is not because you're in, you're in hell because you were rich and he didn't have anything. So now he has that. That's not how that. It's just showing how an uh, example of that. The man had everything on earth, but you know what Lazarus had? Lazarus had everything because he had faith in God. See, this is told, this happened before Jesus died. But no matter what, his faith was in Yahweh. So, it says here, and and so now he's here being comforted while you were in anguish, and besides, There is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. You know, there have been movies made about people who end up in one place, and they fight their way out of it and get to heaven. That's a movie. Okay? 
no matter how great you think you are, without Jesus, without repentance, without salvation, believing on him, you will not escape hell. That's just the truth. That's the truth. So, so we see, oh, I think I have one more. Go ahead. Do I have one more slide on that? Oh, I'm there. Cool. You got me. Thank you. You're ahead of me. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him, here it is, send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them. So they don't end up in this place of torment. Now all of a sudden, he's a missionary. Right? So that they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will surely repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham says to him, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. Man, this is a powerful story. This is a powerful story. And you can be, well, he talked about hell today, and I don't think, these are Jesus' words, not mine. Well, we shouldn't talk about it. Oh, that's just a little scary. We don't want to. I'm sorry. We need to let our kids know about hell. Our kids need to know about hell. They need to have a very healthy fear of eternity. Not, not a, a, a healthy fear of what will happen, but an excitement of where I'm going to be one day. An assurance to know. So we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at, the the title of this message you saw on the first page is, um, look back if I remember it, Um, what in hell do we need? What in hell do we need? What What do you need? What can you learn from hell? Well, we have a man in hell talking to us. When I, every time I read that story, I think of the song, Hello from the Other Side, with, uh, (laughs) you get it. (laughs) Adele, hello from the other side. Thinking, never mind, none of y'all get that. You'll think about that. Later today, you're going to go, oh, I get that, okay. Um, In hell, the rich man, think about this, the rich man looked up, and what we see here is we need to have a vision of heaven. You know what is more important than just a, a healthy fear of hell? Is a vision of heaven. Is a vision of heaven a goal? A vision of heaven. Jesus never reveals the rich man's name. Perhaps it was, um, maybe he was someone well known in the area. But I suspect the rich man had a great funeral. How many of y'all think that? He was a rich man. He probably had a great funeral. Probably a, a big procession carrying his body. And think about all this stuff in the world that they were doing. And he was already burning in hell. All this stuff, the world. I don't want what the world can give me. I want what Jesus can give me. He's going to take care of you. If you have been someone who is, let's say for 10 years, raise your hand, if you have been following Jesus for 10 years. A follower of Jesus for 10 years. Okay. Okay, keep your hands up. And I want you to put your hand down. When it, Have you, in those 10 years ever had to go without food? You're just so poor, you had to just go without food. Not many of you, huh? He takes care of you, doesn't he? I said it wrong? Oh. <laughs> it's not when you're, when, you're, when you're fasting, okay? We're just talking about because of circumstances. He will always take care of you. He'll always provide for you. Is he going to provide for you super fancy cars and all that kind of stuff? Guys, get used to it. I am not a, um, I'm not one of those preachers that's going to tell you you're all going to be rich here on earth. But I promise you, when you serve him and you're obedient to him, 
He will take care of every one of your needs. And the Bible says he'll give you the desires of your heart, not the wants of your heart. There's a difference in that. There's a difference. What's burning in you? That new car is not burning in you. Having a child one day will burn in you. He'll take care of you. So we see those things. And Jesus, I want him more than anything else. As I, I said, there was probably a great funeral for him. Speaker after speaker probably talked about how wonderful he was. They probably talked about how he gave to the poor, but no one mentioned how he couldn't help Lazarus at his gate. I'm sure they reported that uh, he had gone to his reward in heaven. See, he had to have been a religious Jew. He calls out to Father Abraham. A Gentile is not going to call out to Father Abraham. You with me? There's little things in this story that give you clues. And Abraham even says to him, son. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. But it doesn't mean we're all going to heaven. You understand? One split second after the rich man died, he got the strange feeling something wasn't right. Jesus simply said, in hell, where he was in torment, he lifted up his eyes. What did he see? He saw people. He saw people in heaven. The next scary thing that he noticed was that he could see into heaven. Think about that for a minute. This is what Jesus is telling us. He could see into heaven. He could see people basking in the presence of Jesus. He could see when the beggar Lazarus died, it doesn't say that he was buried or had a funeral. He was probably thrown into a trash dump. But the Bible says that angels came and escorted him, his soul, into heaven. I tell you, I'll pass up the big funeral on earth to have an escort of angels into the presence of my Savior. So, so we see here that he's in the presence of Abraham there, and people often ask, and, and you got to understand, this is before Jesus dies on the cross. That's a whole theological thing I'm not going to get into, okay? People often ask if we will recognize each other in heaven. I believe we must certainly will. I mean, this is an example right here. The rich man looked up and he recognized Lazarus. He, he actually recognized Abraham. And, and if they can recognize us from hell, do you think you're going to be able to recognize each other in heaven? If them hell they can recognize us, don't you think in heaven we'll be able to recognize? The Bible says we will. But we won't know each other as we knew each other. Because we will all be married to Jesus. We're the bride of Christ. So forget the fire and the flame. One of the worst agonies of hell will be the ability of people in hell to see those who are in heaven and to be reminded of what they've missed out on. Number two, he could remember his life on earth. How do we know that? Because verse 25, Abraham said, son, remember. Son, remember. Remember. Think about this. If you can remember, you're going to remember every time you sat in a service, every time you had an opportunity to accept Jesus, you're going to look back and remember every time and remember you walked away from it because of selfishness, because of how much you just wanted to enjoy the world. Does it mean that because you accept Jesus, I say, I say, I've said this a couple of times, just be enjoying the world. Does it mean because you accept Jesus, you can't enjoy things in the world? 
How many of you, since you've accepted Jesus, you're happier than you've ever been? You're happier than you've ever been. We get this idea that to serve Jesus is all about, you. I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. I'm going to have to say no. What happens is you accept Jesus, you begin to not want to do those things. When your life really changes, your heart changes, you don't want to do those things. So, a scary couple word or thought is that we will be able to remember. Hell will be a place of eternal remembrance and regret. God loves you, and he doesn't want you to go to hell. Hell was never intended for you, uh, for human habitation. Listen to this, Matthew 25, 41. It won't be on the screen. Let me just read it to you. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels. It was prepared for Satan and the fallen angels, but those that said, I'm not going to accept you, Jesus, you just became part of that third of heaven that got cast out because you will not accept Jesus you're following Satan, and you're going to follow what was meant for him. And he wants to take as many of you because you are the prized creation of Jesus. You are the prized creation, and he wants you to burn in hell because he wants to hurt God. You understand? He wants to hurt God. There's another thing in hell that we need to know. In hell, the rich man cried out. He cried out. He said, we need to hear the voices from hell. Can you imagine if you could hear the voices of hell? He gave out a cry of personal agony, help me. At one point, he just cries out, help me. Figure if you're in hell, you're going to hear that a lot. It's hard when you're in a hospital and you're walking through and you hear that person that's down in that one room and they're just, ah, you know, you just hear, anybody ever been in a hospital and you hear that person just in agony in their room or if you're in the ER, I remember I was in the ER one time and I had, um, it was a kidney stone and it hurt pretty good but every time they gave me a shot I felt a whole lot better. They just kept giving me good stuff. <laughs> but I remember the girl beside me was just screaming the entire time. And it was so disturbing. Isn't it disturbing to hear somebody in pain? Think about it. When you're in hell, it's not just going to be you. You're going to hear everyone around you. A cry of personal agony. He cried out for Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water, to touch his tongue. He was in such agony. Agony, if I could just have one drop of water on my tongue. Just one drop of water. I know every time I wake up in the middle of the night now, we, we put in a new ceiling fan that works really well in our bedroom. And, and, and I wake up about 5.30. And y'all you know, you know what I mean? And my mouth is so dry, and I got a water bottle right beside me. I take drinks of water. I, I drink like a whole bottle of water while I'm sleeping during the night. Because my mouth is so dry. Can you imagine crying out in such agony? Can you just have him drop one drop of water on my tongue to give me just a little bit of relief? Can you imagine what that would be like? Only Jesus can satisfy, satisfy this thirst. Jesus said, if anyone thirsty is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And you have the opportunity now to drink. People in our culture have made a joke out of hell. They think that hell is going to, a, to be a place of fun, frolicking with your friends. We're all just going to party when we're there. Look at this quote. Ted Turner, everybody know who Ted Turner is? Guy who created CNN, TBS, TNT. Now he makes a lot of buffalo burgers. Or bison, is that what it is? Bison burger? Says in a speech to the National Press Club, Ted Turner said this, Heaven is going to be a mighty slender place. Most of the people I know in life 
aren't going to be there. There are a few notable exceptions. I don't know in life aren't going to be there. Okay. There are a few notable exceptions, and I will miss them. Laughter. Everyone laughs when he says it. Remember, heaven is going to be perfect, and I don't really want to be there. Those of us that go to hell, which will be most of us in this room, most of you journalists for sure, are certainly going there. Everybody laughs again. We're all laughing about going to hell. But when we get to hell, we'll have a chance to make things better because hell is supposed to be a mess. And heaven is perfect. Who wants to go to a place that's perfect? Boring, boring. And they all laugh again. Yeah. Laughing about burning in hell. Of course, to them, well, you know, we're people that get it done. We get to hell. We'll fix things. We'll change it around. We'll put in some air conditioning. You see what I'm, do you see how light people take it? You see how the world takes it? And then we get things of like real studies. We've got, we have Bible seminary students who don't believe in hell. And they're going to go out and pastor churches. What's the purpose? Our purpose is to save people, to get people and snatch them out of hell. Our purpose is to reach the lost. You can tell that ticks me off a little bit. Here it is. We talk about a rich man. This is a rich man's take on hell. Second thing we see here is a cry of concern for his family. Warn them, he says. You've got to warn them. Verse 27 I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And suddenly the rich man, like I said before, he becomes a missionary. We've got to reach the lost. When you realize hell is real, your missionary spirit inside of you is going to be stronger. Abraham gives an astonishing reply to the rich man's prayer. He says his brothers have the Bible, the law, and the prophets. That's all they need to miss hell. They just need to read the book and obey it, and they'll be fine. That's all they need to do, he says. If they will just read it and believe it, they can be saved from hell. The rich man insists that if if a dead man, if a dead man, If a dead man who could rise from the dead go and say to them, I'm sure they would believe. And you imagine being at a funeral. You're at a funeral and three days later you have a um, a, um, a Scrooge experience. Your good friend Marley, who just went to his funeral, is knocking on your door. Saying, look, you've got to change. You don't want to go where I'm going. You don't want to go where I've already been. They let me come back and warn you. Can you imagine? You don't want to go there. You think that'll change you, right? That experience. What's interesting, Jesus is the one saying this. Abraham said, if they don't believe God's word... They won't believe it if someone rises from the dead. Jesus is saying this story just weeks before he goes to the cross and rises from the dead. And people still, we've made a joke out of him. And the world still mocks him. <coughs> Wes. <coughs> how much? How much do we how much do you want to protect people from hell? How much do you want to protect people from hell? <coughs> no, I, I'm gonna we have no assurance of tomorrow. There is no promise of tomorrow. 
but there is a promise of the eternity. And as I said at the very beginning, that young man looking at the epitaph on that tombstone, I got to know which way you went. This week, well, let me just, in the Assemblies of God, as Assemblies of God Church, we have, um, we have a general superintendent who oversees all the states. And then you have district superintendents who oversee each state or each section, some sections, some states. Florida has two sections. Um, we have one in South Carolina. And each section has a district superintendent. So it's like if you want to look at there's the president and there are the governors. And what they are is that superintendent is a pastor over the pastors of that state. That's a person because as pastors, we need to have someone we can talk to. So that superintendent is in place for that and, and to oversee, and superintendent has to come with his executive board, and he has to sometimes correct. He also has to come behind and lift up and help and, and oversee the district. And um, When I first came here, our superintendent was mainly a caretaker for his wife who was dying of cancer. And so he wasn't around much. And then she died my first year here and went to be in heaven and we know exactly where she is. There's no doubt whatsoever. And then he went through this horrible grief that he just, depression, that he disappeared. So the last year, this is my third year, this last year, he met a woman. Her husband had died. I, I know that lady from Florida. And wonderful man of God she was married to for years who, who had died. And they met. They had known each other at Southeastern University. And they started to talk and get to know each other again. And just a year ago last week, from last week, they got married. And this last year, our superintendent, he has been at everything. He has had so much energy. He has... He has just been a different person. I feel like I got to know my superintendent for the first time. We were at general counsel. Man, he's walking everywhere. He had health problems. He had no issues of health problems. He was, I mean, he was at every, at, at district, or general counsel, you have a thing that our youth do called fine arts. And so there were fine arts going on the whole entire time of counsel in these other rooms. And that's where kids are doing drama or singing or they're doing different things with fine arts. And, and, and he tried his best to go to every South Carolina student's fine art. He was trying to do his best to be there. He's running all over the place. His wife is with him. Just, he, I, I haven't seen him smile so much. Last week on Tuesday night at 10.30, he went to bed a little bit early. And he went to meet Jesus that night, had a heart attack in his sleep. Tuesday, we're going to be going, and it's going to be a huge funeral service, I'm sure. So staff won't be here Tuesday. We'll be in Columbia pretty much most of the day. Why did I tell you that? Because you have no promise of tomorrow. Everything had turned around. Why would God take him now? Why would God take him now? Because when it's time, it's time. When God's ready, he's ready. I love um, Ruth is his present wife. And she had, and both of them talked about their spouses all the time. And Ruth hadn't said much, but her daughter said something on Facebook and just said, I just want to, I just want to say thank you to Vic Smith. For loving my wife, loving my mom for the last year like he did. He said he loved our family. I've never seen my mom smile and laugh as much as she did the last year. And I just want to thank him for treating my mom like a queen. It was beautiful. And then later Ruth said, I haven't said much. I'd have the words, but I'm going to thank my daughter. Because she just put the words that I wanted to say.
We're going to go Tuesday and celebrate his life because we know where he is. Do you know where you're going to be if death came knocking on your door? Do you know where you will be? That, that's, that is the most important question. That's the most important question.